Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Beautiful day in the neighborhood, huh? Yes, it is. We are grateful for the snow. Well, yeah, it could be better no, I think, no. if it had some lovely white stuff, but at least it's sunny out there, right? Good to see everybody. So today is a bit of a, a game changer and change of plans in that uh, we were going to uh, Revelation Points worship team, which I'm playing with in the morning, was going to do the same set to our service today, which was going to be kind of fun to do. And we were ready to go until uh, their lead vocalist female, uh, Janine, a sore throat, and then uh, Brett, who plays guitar, he uh, has COVID. Oh, so okay. some people do anything about getting out of it. So, and so what we're gonna do, we're, we're just gonna sh change things up a little bit. I gave Darlene a quick call because uh, Chris is now out of town and down in Florida to this weekend. So we're just going to sing a couple of songs, and then we're going to have a testimony time as well as a prayer time, and then we'll get into the, the message. And so we'll just have a, a family-oriented morning worship service, so you may want to be thinking about that going forward as you work. So let me just share a few announcements, and then the, what we'll do is we'll uh, have Bo read scripture and open a prayer, and we'll sing a couple of hymns, and then we'll have it a time of, of sharing and testimony as we go along there. But so a lot of stuff happy. I had a good business meeting. They didn't vote me out. Although it was a close vote, I think, like only like 51%. Yeah, <laughs> that was Ethel. You gotta watch out for her. She's doing well. Good reports back. We're rejoicing that things are not cancerous for her. Uh, so next week starts Bible studies for the men and women at four in the afternoon. So the ladies are doing on gratitude. The men, we're going to use the book by Yancey called Prayer. Does it make a difference? It's a really good book. Uh, Philip Yancey's a book. He has a way of writing and, and he can address some of the tough issues, you know, why and why not some of the stuff and, and gets us thinking. So for men, we're gonna be meeting at four, the ladies are meeting at four, so that's going forward, gonna be a, a nice time to do that. The ladies are gonna do now, instead of knitters for missions, they're going to once a month come together an indoor picnic and sack lunch for all ages to be able to come and to fellowship. And so you've got little flyers and that's gonna be kind of fun. So we hope that that would be something and, and all different ages as well. And you don't have to come and knit anything. They did say in the business being that you even could crochet if you wanted, but, but no, you, it, it's just to come and fellowship and if things continue in a different direction down the road, that would be wonderful to do that. So there's a lot of things, there's statements, youth retreats and things like that are, that are in the works. And so we'll look forward to that. So if our infamous youth director, Bo, would come and read some scripture and, and to open a word of prayer, then we'll sing a couple of songs and then have testimony time. Good morning. Good morning. I'm excited to be here this morning and uh, yeah, have, have a little bit of a different service than we planned, but that's exciting and we'll enjoy that. Um, this morning our scripture reading is from James. Uh, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. We don't have it up on the screen for you, but I'll read it right here. <clears throat> James 4, verses 1 through 7. It says, what, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Bow your heads with me, please. Lord, thank you for this day and the chance to gather and worship you. Um, thank you for the ability to, to still be here and, um, and bring worship uh, to you, even when plans are changed a little bit and, and things don't quite go exactly as we have planned, uh, that happens a lot in our life. There's a lot of times we think we know what's going to happen and 
it doesn't end up happening that way, but you remain the same through all of that. We praise you for that. Uh, we're so grateful. This morning, I just pray that you would uh, bless our worship and um, that you would come and, and be a part of it. That you'd come into this place and, and join us here where two or more are gathered. You are there also. We pray that this morning. We pray you'd be with Pastor as he brings a word uh, from you. And as we leave from this place, as we go through the week and even as we go through the year this new year uh, we just ask for your presence and your guidance always and that we would uh, draw close to you in moments in moments when we need to and that we would feel you um, right by our side we love you lord pray your blessing again on the service this morning and in jesus name amen Lord, here we are, a little bit different day today with uh, sicknesses and music changes, but Lord, we know that uh, we live in a world that is beautiful, but has fallen, and there's diseases and all kinds of surprises, and yet we are grateful we can have this time as a family to give testimonies and praises and prayer requests, and thank you for this wonderful gift of prayer that we are articulating uh, to you by faith, knowing that you're here, and you're hearing us, and even though maybe our hearts don't feel it, we, by faith, trust that you know, and you hear, and you know the circumstances of all these petitions, and you know the outcomes before we do, but I'm grateful that you're just uh, always on top and working, and, and reminded in the book of Daniel that heaven rules, you, your will will be accomplished. And even in circumstances where we just shake our head and understand how or why, we trust your working and in our individual lives and our families. Lord, there uh, are often issues of the heart, heavy concerns uh, that all of us share, maybe loved ones, family members, job, uh, relationship challenges. Now, Lord, we're just, we don't have, we don't even know what to ask specifically for. We trust that you continue to work in and through them, and that you would uh, draw. We, we know that you're walking with us and at each step of the way. And uh, Lord, for your glory and your plans and your purposes, we continue to lift up before you Carolyn and her healing, and Bob and Sherry, as she continues to heal with her knee, and Carl and his breathing. Ethel will rejoice in her good uh, report, with, as well as Irene, and so grateful for that. And, uh, Nancy's brothers. Uh, doing better, and we're grateful for him, Sarah and Katie's, uh, Sarah's mom, and thank you. Lord, for Kevin, um, Lord, uh, communication has been, the last couple of weeks has not been there, so it's probably overwhelming, and uh, he's in uh, uh, with cancer, and it, it, it will uh, overcome him, Father, and I'm sure it's difficult with you just working in a very special way. We thank you for the Geetings. I'm grateful for their ministry and how you provide it. I want to just think of all of our missionaries, so we think of the Southwells who will be with us in about a month, and as we have Missions Month, and we have the Harders, and we have the Kennys, and Winsome. Thank you for each one of them, Father. May you just keep them uh, encouraged as they serve and uh, as they're involved day in and day out, and, and protect them from the enemy and the discouragement that comes. Lord, we're here. We're your servants. Ask that you bless us. That as Jabez prays, Lord, that we you bless us and be blessing God in larger territories, guide and direct us and keep us from harm and help us not to cause pain. You honor that prayer. And I ask, Lord, that as individuals, that we too would seek you and serve you and honor that as we serve you. Thank you. As we continue and spend time in your word, may our hearts be receptive, that we would hear the Spirit of God working in our hearts. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Give me a moment here to transition. I got a fresh one today. <laughs> that didn't sound right, did it? <laughs> there are uh, some up here, but you know, I don't know if David from Rev Point or whatever has uh, used it or for what, but... Um, Let's 
see. I heard a thud. That was Bob, wasn't it? Good to see you, Josh. Continue to remember Josh in military service. We had coffee this week. And what did you say? I mean, this is brutally honest. You said there's like 15, 20 suicides a month of, 22 suicides a month of, of military personnel. Is that just the Army or the all branches? Military. Military. And that, you know, think about that. The, the heaviness and all of that is, is just really difficult. And so uh, he has an opportunity to minister and to touch lives. And uh, it, I mean, it's front lines work, isn't it? Foxhole, you get in the foxhole with people and the system. And so uh, you do that, keep up the good work. So I've entitled this Spiritual Success Strategies. I just thought that, oh, that'll get their attention. All right, strategies, I mean, it, it makes like a contemporary, you know, one of the hardest things is not coming up with a sermon, but to come up with a nifty title, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, it's something that'll catch people's attention. But as I thought through this, James probably never thought that this was a strategy. I think he was just kind of getting down to business. Uh, but it is a strategy in a sense of what spiritual success is. And, and, he, and, the, and he's pretty straightforward in the fourth chapter. So we're going to finish James and then go on to some other stuff. But let me start with a story. I shared this before. It was, and, and some of you may remember it, but it was well over 20 years ago, and I was involved with a funeral at the, the funeral at the graveyard uh, just over here at Plainfield. And Dave Pedersen was in charge of Pedersen Funeral Home, and I, was, I had driven with him in the coach and uh, went to the gravesite and was involved with that. And I don't remember who it was, but all of a sudden, we, you know, we get everything done, everything went well, and, uh, and then Dave Patterson's on the phone, and all of a sudden, I think he got in the hearse and boom, he took off. And he left me there for about an hour, because <laughs> I had ridden in the hearse, and I didn't have a car there. So I was sitting there going, and, you know, everybody was leaving, they were getting ready to fill things in, and I go, I didn't know, I didn't have a cell phone with me, or, or nothing, I was at Dave, when he came back later, was all apologetic, of course, if you knew Dave, I had to razz him about that quite often, uh, but here's the story, that he had a family that was just incredibly difficult, if I remember the story, they had a funeral service planned, and the family like, almost got in fights at the service, and they stopped it. And then they would reschedule a service. They got some, some pastor, bless his heart, agreed to do it. But he said, if there's any, any sign of disagreement, I'm out of here. <laughs> so something was happening. That's when Dave got the phone call. And he was shook up. And he took off and forgot all about me. Because the family was, you know, the Hatfields and McCoys kind of thing. We're going at it. Well, conflict. Life is full of conflict, isn't it? Uh, and James addresses it. I mean, he doesn't mince words. He talks, and he's talking to the body of Christ. But in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet. You cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. I mean, I've heard that from different people in funeral businesses that sometimes, you know, you see the worst and the ugliest when things like that, tensions and decisions and loss, and maybe when there's money involved. But sometimes it doesn't take much for internal strife, does it? Let alone our own self, let alone, I'm sure none of your families have ever gotten into a tiff. Huh? Or, yeah. And so James is dealing with this, and, and don't worry, we're going to, well, what's the strategy in this? First of all, you've got to identify it. And it, as I was even reading through this morning and reading this part, he never says, well, they're kind of to blame too. He's just saying, wait a minute, it's, it start within you. And you have to examine your heart and mind. We're always one, you know, like, it was the woman you gave me, or 
you know, am I my brother's keeper? I mean, it's, we always like to deflect it on somebody else or they're half the problem. That's why I'm doing this, that, and the other thing. Really? And I think as called as peacemakers, even if there is a wrong, there's something about it. The scripture talks about us just to be a peacemaker, not uh, raise the ante and, and increase the level of intensity, but it's to follow it and, and quarrels. And, he, and he's pretty straightforward as he goes on to this, as, uh, as I read a little earlier to us. You ask and do not be, uh, receive because you ask wrongly and spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Now that's pretty strong words, isn't it? If somebody said that about you or us, yeah, uh, you do not, uh, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? That's an interesting word, doesn't that go back to Genesis? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is too, uh, there's no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud that gives grace to the humble. And here's the strategy. We're supposed to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And he goes on to things. Pretty straightforward about that. So, spirit, we always like, how to be successful? Well, it starts with just coming to God and being humble in his presence. And to receive the grace from him and even though there's many things warring around us and there may be even just cause, that's not helping anybody in anything at all. So if you want to follow with your outline, the first thing is uh, the source of conflict. Now, I know I've mentioned it to staff and, and maybe prayer. There is a new thing out there that's called goblin mode. Post-COVID, they're saying people are, some of them are in goblin mode, just ornery. Isn't that an interesting phrase? They're just, and have you noticed it just in last year or two, post-COVID, whatever, they're just goblin. They're just my heart and it's shorter fuse and they're goblin mode. Don't be looking at anybody near you and your family. <laughs> huh? But it, it doesn't take much, does it? Somebody ticks us off and know what button to push. Well, the source of the conflict, the scripture is, is it, it comes near, it's it coming within, as it talks about here, and it'll, we'll talk about passions in a little bit. Now, I'll bring this up just briefly. We have not had to deal with it personally. I mean, we're in North Grand Rapids, Northeast Grand Rapids, Rockford. We don't have a lot of diverse individuals, ethnic group, but tomorrow's Martin Luther King Day, and you may or may go, oh, you know what they're doing. I tell you what, if you have an African-American friend that you're close with, you get it. There, you know, or any ethnic group that has been dealt with in, inappropriately, that, you know, some of the, the, the buddy, I've got a couple friends that are African American pastors, and, and through the years talk with them. It, it, you know, any given moment, somebody could just give them a look or be unkind. It's not stopping, even though it's not as bad as things used to be in some way. It's prejudice or thought. There's conflict there, there's tension, there's hurt, there's pain. Let's keep that. Let's not, those we're called not only just in ethnic issues, but in all things to be peacemakers and the fights and quarrels. And you know what? It goes back to the old nature. Our old nature, first and foremost, is pretty much to put them up. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you, or react, or respond, or whatever it is. Or we, oh, we're, we're a hurt puppy and go away. Oh, oh, me, they were unkind, they hurt my feelings. And, and there's plenty of that going around. But, Sometimes we contribute to it as well. And, it is, and there's not an easy answer there, but this is what James is saying. There are quarrels that cause fights among you. This is to a church. You know? We had a business meeting earlier. No fights. Amen. Isn't that good? Yeah. Miracles never cease. No, we had, a, you know, it's wonderful in the body of Christ working together. Now there, I've been to different churches and business meetings, board meetings. Ooh, not pretty sometimes or wherever. But I think part of the source of it, it really comes within, and it comes in with uh, our heart's desire that we need to be really cautious of. So James cautions them. This is by Warren Wiersbe, and the more I read that, the cause of every war, internal, 
and external is rebellion against God. Now you may look at that and go, that's kind of straightforward or blunt or all-encompassing, but think about that. And especially when he talks about the, every war or the ones internal as well as the external, it's, it's a self-centeredness, isn't it? A rebellion against God. That's where he says here, a success strategy to our spiritual life is we got to deal with this thing called pride. And that's where we have to humble ourselves before God, which, whoo, is really hard sometimes, right? So that's a good thought. And we're just, we just had to wake at both the things internally and externally. And the relationships, your job, your family, whatever it is, you know, the root cause of it is, and though there are maybe some, what we see fault on the other side at the same time, we often jump in and make it worse. <laughs> Anger management. When angry with someone, it helps to sit down and think about the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's the golden retrievers are the cutest puppies. Uh, I, I wouldn't suggest that if it's a family member, although you may want to. <laughs> and that's a whole other thing, but to, for us to be aware of that. The second thing we look for is passions. It's kind of been a buzz term in, in business and life. You know, what are your passions? What are your passions? First thing that comes to mind is chocolate. <laughs> And uh, maybe pizza. And we think about those kind of things. But the word is in there, and it's multiple times. Now, in the Greek word is the word we get hedon, hedonism. Hedonism is not a nice thing. It's all about selfish pleasure, hedonistic. And so that's the same word. So James is saying, you have quarrels and fights among you because of your passions, the internal emotion that is not God-fearing and getting the best of you. And so these passions, now having passion is not a bad thing. It's, it could be a good thing in a sense if our passion is to serve God, our passion to use our spiritual gifts, our passion to assist and come alongside. Those things that motivate us, those things that drive us. But if that old nature creeps in there, it messes up with our thought, it messes up the passion we struggle with that internal old self, don't we? Some psychologists call it the little self, the little Kirk within, uh, or we do, because there is an element of who you are today is a combination effort of all the experiences of life, and somewhere along the way there may be an emotional dimension of you that hasn't matured or hurt and pain from years gone by. They call that your little self, your inner self. And if that voice gets too loud or causes you to think like an infant, and sometimes it pushes us to do things that we wouldn't be great or wouldn't be appropriate to do. But there's, there's the passion that James is talking about. Now, we got to have the passions to make sure they're the right kind of passions. Yes, maybe chocolate and pizza. Oh, by the way, I uh, met and had uh, lunch with uh, David Fries, the pastor, last weekend at BC Pizza. And I talked with him about having pizza on a Sunday after church. And all God's people said... So the next two or three weeks, we'll come up with a Sunday, and you know, at 12, 12, 15, they'll open it up just for us, and we'll have pizza buffet. Won't that be nice? That's, uh, now, I can't go on. You're thinking of food. The <laughs> sermon's over. Another, and I have, I haven't necessarily gone verse by verse. I'm just picking out the highlighting, the highlighted things. So the, the fights are not a good thing, but I think as I look at this even more so, I don't think their prayers you ask and do not receive. He goes, you do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. So this, this whole thing of unanswered prayer, now that's kind of what the guys were going to do in this book with uh, Yancey. Uh, you go, God, why don't you answer my prayer? Why and why and, and not that we're there's no there's no magic formula, but there are uh, things that can encourage us as we walk in our faith and as we think about prayer and some things that would encourage us as well. Um, I like what you, many of you. There's a Damien. Excuse me for a second. 
Damian um, Hamlin, the football player that got hit uh, a week or two ago, their chaplain is, uh, is uh, hold on a second if you would please, he, he met them and he was on the sideline and he says, when Damien went down, a lot of us began to pray right away. Van Den Boss is his name. And we had a strong core of players and coaches who were followers of Jesus. So that in our immediate reaction was to pray. Uh, Van Den Boss stood about 30 yards from Hamlin when the play occurred. And it was, soon, uh, it was soon out on the field with others. And people grabbed hands next to them. Some guys were praying. Some were crying. A lot of us were in disbelief, he said. We prayed on the field, we prayed in the locker room, we prayed when we got to the hospital. Those prayers had a multifaceted effect on all involved. God invites us to prayer by listening to him as well as sharing our hearts and requests, Van den Bosch said. Prayer's purpose is to build this relationship and to align us with his will. It's in this alignment that we grow and learn how to follow him. And gratefully, at least to our understanding, at this present time, the, the gentleman is, is improving. But then how do you, on the other hand, go, well, God, we prayed diligently, and you didn't seem to answer this prayer, Mark. Isn't that the challenge? Of which there's no specific answer, but there is an answer in the fact that God is in control. So here's some thoughts as we think about this in prayer. Uh, James says none of the things that reasons for unanswered prayer. One of all, he says the wrong motives. You're asking selfishly. So I think as we, as, as we think through our prayer lives, as we think of things requesting, I mean, I haven't prayed for a red Corvette recently. <laughs> <laughs> I may end up with a little one. <laughs> you know, like that, or whatever, I mean, there's motivation, there may be. So one needs to, and, and it also says something about God as he hears his kids pray to him, the motivation behind it. Now that gets kind of scary in some ways. But there's nothing wrong with them. I mean, it says it right here that they're warring, they're fighting, their motivation, they don't, they're asking in wrong passions. Their, the motives are not right. And so that's, that God doesn't respond to that. Sometimes it's just they weren't asking. It says you do not have because you did not ask. Now that sounds kind of simplistic, but you know what? It's amazing how many people just assume God knows or don't want to bring it before him or doesn't think that God wants to hear about it. You know, there are times if you're wondering about the motive, just say, Lord, I don't know. I just lift this situation to you. There are circumstances where <sighs> life can be complicated, can it? And, and I go, Lord, I don't even know how to articulate what I'm asking you to pray for other than this is the best. And I'm just trusting you, I, I, just to, that your grace would do a work here. I think that's okay. Who am I to know all the answers, especially with the complications of life and, and people and things. But make sure that we're even asking. I don't think we have to do it every hour, but God wants to be persistent in prayer, but keep asking and trusting. Enmity, now that's an interesting word. Enmity, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's the tension, that's pride, that's a warring. So there's pride and enmity with God. And David said, and I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So that's something that I wait like to see with it. And no faith. Earlier in James chapter 1, it said to pray in faith. If you didn't pray in faith, you're like the wind and the sea. Or chapter 5 and 15, it's the, which we're going to get to down there. That's a tough passage to talk about anointing and oil and uh, praying with elders and hens. But it says the prayer of faith. So there's something that has to be there when we go to God that he honors our faith. Not that it's a feeling, but just our trust in him because the righteous live by faith. And then also in the last chapter, the righteous, it says the prayer of the righteous availeth much, is the old King Jimmy. Uh, now that's an interesting thought. I mean, righteousness, I'm not righteous on my account, but only through the blood of Christ. But there's something about him that I've done all that I need to do to make sure that because when you look at James chapter 5, it talks about how the elders praying over people. It's the first thing to ask them if there's any sin in their life. Because if there is, then there's not going to be any healing. So interesting. It got quiet all of a sudden, didn't it? <laughs> well, 
by God's grace, we all have those areas we're working on, right? None of us are perfect examples. When we get to heaven, all things new. Yay, glorified, be like Christ. In this time, the old nature, like Paul says, the things I don't want to do, I do, and what I do, I don't want to do. Um, it's been aptly entitled the do-do list of those things. Yeah, we have, but to our best endeavors as we pray righteously. God will work it through. So there's some thoughts. This is kind of, if you want, spiritual strategy to prayer, but that's a lot what James talks about if you think through that. All right, another thing that he, another point, this word enmity. That's a strong word, but go back to Genesis, and if you grew up and had to memorize King James, what happened with the fall, Adam and Eve, and what did God say to Eve? I will put enmity between you and your so that's why women don't like snakes. <laughs> well, that may be a bit of a stretch. I don't know if anybody likes snakes that much. You, Bo does. Yeah, he's in youth ministry. You get it, you know. <laughs> and big turtles and whatever. You had a pet snake, didn't you? Who? You still, you don't have them anymore, do you? They're not at the parsonage. No. That's good, because we'd have a board meeting about that one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why on the internet they always find these big pythons, and I think somebody found the live one. Uh, what was it? Oh, oh this is off the cuff. Uh, in, Burm in Thailand, something 20, they found a 20 some foot long python that had, uh, there was a person inside. Yeah, it was a grandmother. Oh, and she, she was, a, yeah. Now that creeps you out. This, <laughs> this is really off. But you get enmity, okay, that's strife, huh? So enmity with God, you don't want that. You don't want anything between us and God. And enmity, or the word may go on to say uh, more than enmity, but it means a hostility, hatred, strife. Because it, if we're not, if, if pride begins to take over, and we're not trusting and submitting ourselves to God, then, then self rules. And that's not a good, healthy thing for the, the walk of faith. And as he goes on here, it talks about friendship with the world. Now let's think about that. that growing up from a legalistic background, wasn't my folks, but you know, the worldliness to us was short hair, not listen to certain music, and go, don't smoke and chew and go with the girls that do, kind of stuff. There's, there's more of that involved that it, is, is much more important than that. It's not necessarily external. But look at the world as a system. Worldliness as a system. It's a value system. It's a perspective. It's humanistic. It's self-gratifying. And that can creep into our lives. And that's going to put distance between us and God. We start thinking about ourselves more important than what the, the God and, and circumstances and situations can surely do that puts tension between, and uh, that's something that we have to be aware of, that there's not this enmity that we open up to. And it's hard. We live in this world. We're supposed to live in the world and be separate of it. At the same time, holiness, uh, nothing hindering between our soul and the Savior. It doesn't necessarily, even the external acts are one thing. The more challenging thing is what's going on in here and here. Even the outflow of that is just a demonstration of this internal struggles which we have. So in, a, in the strategies of spiritual success, is let's make sure there's nothing causing enmity or warring within us and putting a separation with God. Because I don't know about you, but I need all the grace I can get. Just ask Jennifer. She knows I need a lot of help. I think we're all in good company with that. So this aspect of enmity, it's an interesting word. And then, uh, grace. Look at verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud and gives us grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter return to mourning. Humble yourselves before God, and he will exalt you. So this is the, the goal of our faith, this is grace. You know, I don't know if you've learned the hard way, but if God isn't giving you grace for each day, we're pretty much relying on our own abilities. 
which I'm finally learning after all these years are not that much <laughs> and not that helpful. I need to follow him and I need the daily grace in our lives and it's coming through a, a submission to him, which is, and we're gonna spend more on it, this is where spiritual victory takes place as we go forward. Um, wasn't that interesting the other day in the uh, air traffic control? Nothing happening so many hours. I don't know if we'll ever hear what did or didn't happen to all of that. But uh, think about that as sometimes have we thought your prayers like that? Just everything's on hold. God doesn't seem to be answering or responding. We don't even know if he's here. So an illustration in closing that I read from uh, the book that we're going to look at with Nancy I got a, multiple pages here. He goes on to express uh, that Edith Schaefer uh, is the daughter of a missionary in, in tells of in, in Hudson Taylor. He was a he was a, one of the from England and started uh, missions in China many many years ago and, and started inland China ministries and he was part of, and the director. Uh, came from that, and they prayed daily, and he walked for hours to pray. Four hours a day, he was praying for people to come to Christ in China. And they had like over a thousand, seven thousand missionaries in China. And then it goes on to say later on that what happened was, what happened soon after they had that? It says the chairman Mao came and evicted all seven thousand missionaries from China. And that was in the 30s, 40s, something like that. Yeah, and he went some connected with the missions that he was. And, and he, and, and including all of those this gentleman had been praying for as a Chinese ambassador. And they relocated the Philippines, Hong Kong, Singapore, and uh, dispersed. And they were dismayed at what happened to the fledgling church in China, where, who now all their help and support had left. And in their absence, the dictator and the realm that forbid Christianity and evangelism. And yet, if history, as you know, God worked that the church in China is booming. And it continues to go, and it says that the greatest numerical revival in history broke out after the fact. And what happened to China and the happening now exceeds beyond all dreams the prayer requests of the missionaries had in 1950. If you want to see God smile, tell him your plans, was the old saying. I share that just as a word of encouragement as, as sincere godly people are praying that God would do something. And then, have you ever had that, Lord, out of the blue, what, why, it doesn't make any sense. And yet, often, down the road, God has used that like the church in China booming and has and continues to and the prayers did go answered in his way and his time so as we look at some of these spiritual strategies to look at it one of its prayer one of us pray by faith with the right motives to pray righteously but also trusting God that he will hear and work in his own way and to trust him easier said than done isn't it we kind of like immediate answers Lord it's been 15 minutes I'm still waiting, <laughs> you know? Well, we got to trust. He always at work. And, is, and then that, doesn't that make it hard to kind of submit and come and to come near to him and humble ourselves in front of him? Like, you're not answering my prayer. And in fact, it may even look worse, the situation. And yet, God is always at work and working in and through us, of which, uh, which it can be a great blessing. In fact, if you were to go on, I mean, if that's what it took to bring revival in China, so be it, Lord. So if that's what it's going to take for revival in our hearts, you personally, me personally, in us as a believers, as a church, God's going to do the work to trust him and maintain to humility before him because he will lift us up. That's a different contrast to the 
philosophy of the world, which is very humanistic. I'm going to do this. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I can do this, this, and this. There's the human cooperative, yes, but there's also the submission to our Heavenly Father, which is really hard. So, Lord, as we conclude today, we thank you. There's some strong exhortation here in the book of James. Fighting and quarreling. And maybe we think of others. We would probably be ashamed to know what goes on between our ears and our heart. But Lord, sometimes our passions are just not aligned with yours. And so, Father, may we uh, humbly come before you to receive your grace that would enable us to live a life that would be pleasing and joy and success as we, as you define it, faithfully in serving you. And Lord, the, the struggles, even in prayer, and unanswered prayer, or prayer that doesn't seem to be, uh, and we, we know we're supposed to wait, but sometimes the waiting gets really hard. Sometimes we don't even know how to articulate a request. The situation can be so complicated. And yet, Father, you can work in and through and that you are, we forgive us for our lack of faith for doubting that you can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. So, Father, as we just come to you, as we humble ourselves, we just want to make sure that we, there's nothing between our soul and the Savior and that we come before you, not that we uh, want a gift or a prize, but we want to be faithful to be used and that your grace would abound in our lives. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me Thy great salvation, so rich and free. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen and Amen. Blessings.